Hey there, folks. Welcome back for part two of our Up the Neck backup series. In the previous lesson, we talked about some different ways that you can use roll patterns to play up the neck. But today, I want to talk about something pretty exciting that I refer to as the other G lick. What does that mean? Well, if you've been playing for a while, then you're probably familiar with what banjo players call the G lick, which sounds like this. Now, there are a bunch of different ways to play that particular lick and a bunch of different variations of it. But what's cool is there's actually an up the neck version of the same lick with a bunch of different ways to play it and different variations. And it's super common in up the neck backup in bluegrass banjo. And first of all, let's just see what that lick actually sounds like. Now, even if you haven't actually played this lick yourself yet, you've probably heard it in a lot of different contexts. The most common would be tunes like Sally Gooden. Or the B part to Cumberland Gap. And what's cool is a lot of the exact patterns you'll see in those tunes are what gets used to play backup in a really interesting way. By the way, if you're looking for tablature for this lesson and all of my lessons, as well as bonus practice tips, like different ways to play this material in different keys, then feel free to go to patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo, which is where you can get all the bonus content that doesn't end up here on YouTube. Also, if you don't mind, feel free to subscribe to this channel and like this video, which is another huge way that you can help me make more of these videos. So if you do that, I really appreciate it. Anyway, back to the lesson. Okay, so before we move on and talk about different variations of this lick, how to use it, how to practice it, that sort of thing, let's just talk about the mechanics of playing in this position. Because if you've tried to learn these licks before, either in backup or tunes like Sally Gooden or Cumberland Gap, then you'll know it's not the easiest thing in the world. But let's just break down what we're actually trying to do. We've got our index finger on the eighth fret of the second string and our ring finger on the ninth fret of the first string. We're holding those there and then we're reaching with our little finger to the 11th fret on the second string. Maybe there's a little bend there if you want. And then with the middle finger, we're sometimes going to the ninth fret on the third string. And in this particular lick, it sounds like this. So let's first just start by thinking about what it is that we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to hold down these frets and get this little finger two frets away from it, which can feel like a stretch, but depending on how we angle our hand, it doesn't need to be. Think about this. If I have my hands going across the strings like this, and I decide to play this lick, then I'll be more or less in this position. If I try to get my little finger over here, I actually have to separate it from the rest of them in a way that our hands aren't really designed to do. That doesn't feel comfortable. And even if I get there, I don't have any power. I can't really put any pressure on the string. My wrist is, well, pretty far away from where it should be. There's a lot of things about this that just aren't going to work long term. But if I do this, if I angle my fingers so they're pointed more down the string, then when I extend my little finger, it's actually extending naturally in the direction that it goes when you extend your finger. So it's actually a lot closer naturally than it would be. There's a little bit of a stretch and a little bit of adjustment that needs to happen, but I find this is a lot easier. And this doesn't necessarily have to be the only way that you try to do this, but you should know that when something's not working, you don't necessarily need to try to stretch further or just try harder or something like that. Sometimes you can just adjust the angles of things. You can make a lot of changes without making your life that much more difficult. And ideally, when you get to a position that gives you the notes that you're looking for, it's not too uncomfortable. If you find yourself playing the right notes, but you're really all out of whack like this, then chances are you're gonna wanna find something else that's a better long-term solution. Now, assuming you're ready to move on, let's talk a little bit more about how this lick functions. If you remember, this is the other G lick, which means it functions kind of the same as the original G lick. It's just something you play when the chord is G. So if we're playing a tune or a song and the chord is G, this is an available lick to play and it lasts for one measure. And that's great, but we probably should have some other variations of this lick to play so that we don't have to play just one lick all the time. So here's a bunch of different licks that you can play just around this position. Some that are pretty similar, some that are a little different, but all that function more or less the same.
Okay, so now we have a bunch of material that applied to the chord G. And so if we use that in songs that we know that include the chord G, then everything should work out. So then let's see how this would work if we applied this material to a song like Your Love Is Like A Flower. And when the chord is G, I'm just gonna use this material. Okay, great, so that's all good material that you can play over that kind of song over the chord G. But there's one thing you might have noticed is that I played some slightly different material over the C and D chords than what I played from the first lesson in this series. And it's not too complicated, it's just a slightly different roll pattern that I wanted to add in. So just for context, here's a slowed down version of that roll that I'm playing over C and D. There really isn't anything special about that roll pattern as opposed to the other roll patterns. It's just something else that people tend to play. So I'm trying to put in more information, more stuff that you can use. At the end of the day, you really don't wanna be looking at any of this stuff as being the correct stuff to play. It's just examples of things that people have played that fits really well into the style. But you wanna be as flexible as you possibly can with this stuff. Because if you look at some of these licks, exactly how they're written, and think that's all it'll ever be, then there's some combination of these patterns that just won't ever go together. They won't flow from one lick to the next. But if you make a small change, if you're willing to improvise a little bit or think outside the box, then you can combine a lot of these things in really interesting ways, which is actually what most banjo players are doing. These are just examples of things they have done and then you get to play with them. And one great way of doing that is thinking about this stuff in other keys. You can think about these licks as being just for the chord G, but you can actually move them around and use them in other keys so they can apply to other chords as well. For instance, you can play the exact same thing I just played for Your Love Is Like A Flower in the key of G in the key of C instead. And the way I think about that is my index finger when I'm playing these licks is on the note G. So if I put that index finger on a different note, that's kind of the key that I'm playing in or that's the chord that I'm playing over for that particular lick. So if I move up to this position and I'm playing C instead, then the rest of that stuff adjusted to this position is gonna sound great in the key of C. So here's your love is like a flower using all the same licks in the key of C. And for what it's worth, because this can be kind of tricky stuff, don't feel like you need to play along with everything in this lesson right now. It might be worth just watching through the whole thing just to see how it all works and understand the concept. And then you can start at the beginning and really start learning this stuff for real. So you're not just skimming over it. Now, hopefully all of that makes sense. You might not be able to play it all right now, but as long as you get the concept of using these licks in certain places, transitioning between those licks to other chords, then great. But how do you get to the point where you actually can play this stuff? What are some ways that we can practice this material in order to really use it? Well, one of the things you might have noticed listening to other people play up the neck backup in this style is it feels like it flows so freely, like they're just playing these different combinations of licks back to back as if it's second nature. And if you haven't played this stuff yet, then that can seem really difficult just to comprehend how you would even play it, let alone make the choices. Well, the way that practicing really works is that you get better at the things that you actually do. It seems obvious, but if we use that information and apply it to this, then what do we have to do to get to the point where it seems like these licks are just flowing naturally? Well, 
we need to practice playing them in succession, in different combinations. So many different combinations and so much that we can actually make choices on the fly. So if you wanna get really good with patterns like these, then I'm gonna recommend that you do three things. The first is learn some of the tunes that use this material. Sally Gooden and the B part for Cumberland Gap are probably two of the best things that you can learn that use this material. And it'll get you really comfortable with your hand in that position but also with some patterns that you can actually use in up the neck backup. The second thing I would recommend is that you actually play these patterns on a loop. You can either plan them out in one specific way that you can rehearse and practice, or you can take just a couple of them and see if you can flow from one to the other without really deciding too far in advance which one you're gonna play. That might be difficult at first. Maybe you just wanna loop one lick and then loop two licks and you can decide, do I repeat this lick twice or do I go straight to the next lick, that sort of thing. And then as you get more comfortable with that, you can expand that so that you're not really thinking about the patterns as necessarily these little discrete measures, but you're just playing them. It takes a while, but that's the path that you wanna be on. As an example, here's how that could sound if you were just kind of randomly oscillating between two different licks. Now I kind of planned that out for that example in particular, but the idea is that you don't necessarily decide how many times you're gonna play a lick in a row before switching to the next one, that sort of thing. Now, here's an example of the same concept, just using a lot more of those licks. Again, that was kind of planned out as an example for this video, but in general, when I'm actually using this material, I'm not really thinking about it in terms of lick one, lick number two, lick number three, anything like that, I'm just playing. But it's because I did that work beforehand that I'm comfortable with it now. Now, the third thing that I think you should do, which actually dovetails nicely into just using this stuff as music, is to use these examples in songs that you know. And all that requires is just knowing some of these patterns, applying them to the correct chords, and then transitioning into other chords where you're just using the more normal rolling backup. And the examples that I used before for Your Love Is Like a Flower in both G and C are pretty much what I'm talking about. It doesn't really matter what order you use the licks in, you just wanna make sure you're using them over the correct chord and then transitioning to the next chord at the appropriate moment. You could take those examples that I played and just put those licks in different places and that's a good example of what I'm talking about. But at some point you wanna be able to do this without really planning ahead too far in advance. Kind of like with the previous exercise where you're just trying to play all these licks back to back, you're doing that in a more controlled environment where you wanna be playing them for a certain number of measures and then moving to another chord. If you play enough of these that you've written for yourself or that you've planned out, then eventually you're gonna make these decisions faster and faster until you can do it on the fly. And at that point, you're playing these examples on the fly, in songs, that's just playing up the neck backup. So that's the goal and that's kind of where you should be working towards. But I'm fully aware that this is not necessarily the easiest stuff to get a hold of. So if you just need to work on playing these examples on their own, that's totally fine. I would prioritize playing them correctly, getting every note out that you mean to before you move on to really using them. If you understand the concept and you're trying to use them in the right place, but they don't really come out how you're actually meaning to play them, that they're not really worth that much. So prioritize actually playing the notes fully so you actually get a good sound out of each of them before you move on to the next step. Of course, I meant it when I said there's not really a correct way to play all of this stuff. It's really up to you and your taste, but I think we all know the difference between playing something your own way and not really being able to play what it is that you want to. So just keep that in mind as you're practicing. Anyway, I hope you found this lesson helpful. And of course, if you're looking for the tablature or some bonus content, then head to patreon.com slash banjo. Subscribe to this channel, like this video, all of that stuff. But otherwise, that's gonna do it for today. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.